النبي أولى بالمؤمنين من أنفسهم وأزواجه أمهاتهم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ونولا أما بعد وينا موف آن تو the second to the last of our uh, mothers. We're doing the mothers of the believers. And today we will be doing Safiya binti Huyay radiallahu ta'ala anha. And Safiya binti Huyay, uh, she is the only non-Arab uh, mother that we have, the only non-Arab wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she is, of course, the daughter of the Sayyid or the leader of the main Jewish tribe of Medina, the Banu Nadir. Now, the Banu Nadir is one of the three tribes of Medina, as we should all remember from the seerah. And the Banu Nadir uh, was the tribe also of the famous incident of Ka'b ibn Ashraf that was from the Banu Nadir. So, is she Arab? Well, language-wise, yes, but ethnically, no. So, as we had mentioned, the Yehud of Khaybar, the Yehud of Medina, they are Arabicized Yehud. So they speak Arabic as a mother language. Their names have become Arabicized. Their culture is Arabic. But still their ethnicity is, of course, from uh, the Bani Israel. And they are living in that land for a few hundred years. So they are considered to be Arabicized and not actually Arab. And the Banu Nadir, if you remember, they were the second of the three tribes of Medina. And they were expelled. Uh, the Banu Qaynuqa, the Banu Nadir, and then of course the, the massacre of the Banu Qurayla at the end. This is the Banu Nadir. And the Banu Nadir, they were expelled because they attempted to assassinate the Prophet. And so the Prophet surrounded them and uh, they were then uh, given the condition to leave with only what their camels could carry. And the chieftain of the Banu Nadir is the father of Safiya. Okay, so Safiya binti Huyay ibn Akhtab and Huyay ibn Akhtab is the chieftain. So Huyay ibn Akhtab is the chieftain of the Banu Nadir. Where did they go? They went to Khaybar. Okay, so in the second and the third year of the Hijrah, the Banu Nadir were expelled and they then go to Khaybar. So the Banu Nadir settle in Khaybar. Safiya is born in Medina. And she then moves to Khaybar where she is raised as a young lady. So Safiya binti Huyay ibn Akhtab from the tribe of the Banu Nadir. What happened to her father Huyay? Huyay ibn Akhtab, he was not satisfied after having attempted to assassinate the Prophet in Medina. In Khaybar, he then begins to form alliances with the Quraysh and he plays a pivotal role in the, the battle of Khandaq. And if you remember, when we did our seerah, Huyay actually returns to Medina from Khaybar in the Battle of Khandaq. And he is one of the main negotiators with the Banu Qurayza. And he acts as the emissary between the Quraysh and the Banu Qurayza. So he is definitely one of the leaders of uh, Kufr, one of the leaders of uh, trying to eliminate Islam. And when, Khayb, when Khandaq finishes, Huyay is inside Medina, even though his family is in Khaybar, because... He was the ambassador between the Quraysh and between the Banu Quraydha. And he is now trapped inside Medina thinking that he would be victorious over the Muslims, right? Thinking that he would get all of the lands back. Now he is trapped inside. And so when the order is given of the execution, one of the first to be let out is Huyay because he definitely deserves that. And we mentioned when we did the seerah that the execution was because of treason. It was because of what they had done. And Huyay's last words, if you remember them, uh, really demonstrate his character. He turns to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Wallahi, I do not regret having been your enemy. I don't regret having opposed you. But whomever Allah wants to humiliate will be humiliated. Meaning Allah has desired to humiliate me. Whoever desires, whomever Allah wants to humiliate will be humiliated. And then he turned to his people that were still waiting to be uh, executed. And he said to them, O oh my people, this is the qadr and the qadha of Allah that the Bani Israel will suffer calamity after calamity. This is Allah's qadr on us that we will be persecuted towards the end of times. And then he was executed uh, with those who were executed in the uh, after the battle of the trench. Uh, of course, Safiya is still in Khaybar at this time. Uh, Safiya's mother, she passes away, we don't know how, but before the coming of Islam, or at least before her marriage to the Prophet ﷺ, and all we know is her name, Barra binti Samawil, which is Samuel in Arabic, uh, Barra binti Samawil, 
uh, which is how they say Samuel. And uh, all that we know is that she passes away before the marriage to the Prophet Sassim. So she's basically without mother and father when the marriage uh, takes place. And according to Islamic legend, her lineage goes back to Harun or Aaron. And so she is from the elite tribe uh, of the ancient Israelites called the Kohanim, uh, which is the descendants of, of Aaron. How old was she? We don't know for sure, but what we do know is that when the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina, she was a young girl, maybe around 8, 9, 10 years old. So this places her at the time of the marriage, around 17, 18 years old at the time of the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ. And of course, her story is well known. It is mentioned in every book of Sirah. She narrates it in the first person because obviously later on she becomes our mother. So she says, when I was a young girl, I was my the favorite child of my father and even my uncle and they would always play with me and pick me up when they're coming back from their uh, from their long journeys and from the day uh, trips that they had and even from their work and one day uh, after the Prophet had migrated to Medina my father and my uncle went to see him and they came back late at night and I rushed towards them happy thinking that they would pick me up, play with me. But they came walking with slow, heavy steps. And they ignored me, even though I was, you know, wanting to be played with or not. They completely ignored me because of their sadness and their uh, uh, miserable nature. And I heard my uncle say to my father, Ahu Ahu, is he the one? Ahu Ahu, is he the one? And my father said, E Wallah, yes, he is the one. And my uncle said, can you recognize him? Are you sure? And my father replied to my uncle, yes, I recognize him. I know him to be the one who was predicted. And my uncle said, so what will be your mawqif, your stance? What have you decided to do now? So the father is the elder, the father is the chieftain. The uncle is now getting the advice. What do you want us to do as a tribe? And the father says, I'm going to be his enemy as long as I live. And he was consistent with that until his execution. Now this is being narrated to us by the daughter herself. It's being narrated by Safiya herself, hearing this firsthand. That this is how my father felt towards the Prophet Obviously from the time of uh, the expulsion up until... Uh, the marriage, we don't have much information. All that we know is that she was married to one of the tribes of, of, the, of the Yahud and he divorced her. Then she was married to another man, Kinana bint al Rabi'ah, uh, Kinana bint al Rabi'ah, who mistreated her and was abusive towards her. We know this from a number of incidents. Uh, and of them is that before the attack of Khaybar, a few days before the attack, and the Yahud were expecting some type of attack, they were worried about some type of attack, but she didn't know that. She didn't know anything about this. She saw a dream. And in the dream, the full moon appeared over the waters of Khaybar. So she told her husband Kinana that she saw this dream. And she has no idea what it means. And so her husband smacked her and beat her and said, and it, the, the beating was so severe, it left a bruise on her head, on her face that would last for many months. And her husband said to her, do you aspire to marry the king of the Arabs? And she had no idea what he's talking about. But the husband understood that the moon symbolizes the Prophet ﷺ. The rising over Khaybar symbolizes that he will conquer Khaybar. And the fact that she is seeing it symbolizes that she will be his wife. So the husband understood and smacked her and said, Do you aspire to be the wife of the king of the Arabs? Even though he's not a king, but just to make fun of him. And uh, later on, of course, this prophecy was to come true. The Battle of Khaybar, of course, I'm not going to go into it. We did it in a lot of detail. What year did it take place in, guys? Who can tell me what year is the Battle of Khaybar? If you speak, it must be true or else. <laughs> the seventh year, Muharram. Just one year off. You have only 11 years anyway, so one year off, what's the big deal? 10% error anyway. Uh, the Battle of Khaybar takes place in the seventh year uh, of the Hijrah, in the month of Muharram. I went over it in a lot of detail. It was a very fierce battle. One of the reasons why it was fierce was because, should I even embarrass myself and all of you by quizzing you or don't even ask the quiz anymore? Because there were many small fortresses in Khaybar. Okay? It wasn't one simple land. Every sub-tribe had built fortification. So it was one 
fortress after another. It wasn't an one back, uh, victory. And the largest, of course, uh, was conquered by Ali radiallahu anhu, the famous incident where the Prophet said, I'm going to hand you know, the banner to the one who is going to please Allah and his messenger. In any case, it appears that every single surrender took place on different terms. Because at the end of the battle, of course, it was a massive amount of ghanima, one of the largest ghanimas up until that point in time. The largest ghanima, of course, is going to be Hunain, but that's still two years away, uh, three years away. Right now, it is one of the largest, if not the largest ghanima up until that point in time. And the end result was what? That the Yehud negotiated a surrender and they said, let us stay here. We will pay you 50% of the produce as a tax if you let us to stay. And the Prophet said, I will let you stay, but we have the right to renegotiate every year. And of course, Umar later on renegotiated at that time. So 50% was done. And as a part of the Ghanima, some families were taken captive. And it appears, as I said, that this is a case-by-case -case basis, that some families were captive, some families were not. Safiya's tribe or sub-tribe had been taken captive. Okay, so Safiya becomes one of the part of the Ghanima and her husband <clears throat> dies in the battle against the Muslims. So now she comes under the share of the famous Sahabi Dihya Al-Kalbi or perhaps he asked for a Milk Yameen. Well, in, in, in any way, Dihya is involved with uh, her. But somebody goes to the Prophet and says that Ya Rasulullah, that lady is the daughter of Huyay. She is not just anybody. She is the daughter of Huyay, and she is not, it is not appropriate that anyone has her other than you. This is the daughter of the Sayyid of the Banu Nadir, and we cannot just give them to her to any of the Sahaba. And so uh, the Prophet calls her and then says, I give you two choices. Either you accept Islam and you stay with me, or you stay upon your faith, and perhaps Allah will find a way back to your people. You will go back to your people somehow. So she has two options, Islam and stay with me. And she didn't understand what stay with me means here. Or stay upon your faith, stay, remain a Yahudi, and perhaps Allah will find a way back for you. And perhaps when said by the Prophet means you will find a way back. So he's basically saying, accept Islam and stay with me, or remain upon your faith and you will go back to your people. It's a very win-win situation. If you don't believe in Allah and His Messenger, you can go back. And if you believe in Allah's Messenger, well then, I'm giving you a very good option. And Safiya responds, and this shows us how quickly Islam entered her heart. Well, it's a very, very deep story. Unfortunately, we don't have not just time, but even the actual anecdotes are so sparse, we have to read in. We have to understand that her tribe has been conquered and essentially eliminated. The Banu Nadir, the, the Khaybar tribes were different than the Banu Nadir. Her tribe has been conquered and eliminated. Her husband has been killed. Her immediate family no longer exists. Most likely her brother, as we're going to find out, also has been killed. Her husband has been killed. And she is now a captive, not knowing her fate, what's going to happen. And she is brought in front of the Prophet ﷺ, perhaps less than... Five days after all of this has occurred. When they go back and they're going to return, this is when this is going to take place. So few days have gone by. Everything is fresh in her mind. And the Prophet gives her these two options. And she says, Ya Rasul Allah. Already she's a Muslim. Ya Rasul Allah. I desired to accept Islam and believe in you even before you call me to Islam. So I wanted to accept Islam even before you offered Islam to me. And I wanted to believe in you even before I came to your camp. Meaning, even amongst her people, she was not happy spiritually. And deep down inside, she was inclined towards Islam even though she was not amongst the Muslims. And this is because, as we all know, Pure fitras, pure souls are attracted to the truth, even if the truth is not around them. They want something. She was not satisfied being with her people. Spiritually, she was not satisfied. So she says to the Prophet I wanted to be a Muslim even before I was amongst Muslims. That's what she's saying. And I wanted to believe in you even before seeing you. Right? And 
I have no desire to remain upon the faith of my ancestors, the Jewish faith, nor do I have any family or brother or son or father. I have no one immediate family left. Truly, she said, I love Allah and His Messenger more than I love my freedom and more than returning to my people. So she thinks that remaining a slave is what is being offered to her. That's what she thinks. So she says, I am happier being a Muslim slave rather than returning back to my people. That's what she is saying. So we see here that Iman that is truly coming from the heart. Strong Iman immediately. And we see in history such examples of them as the magicians of Fir'aun's time. From where to where instantaneously that strong Iman comes. And this is Allah's blessings that He gives to those whom He chooses. So Safiya radiallahu anha, her Iman was demonstrated from the very beginning and is going to be continuing throughout her short time with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this really shows the purity of her heart that she wanted Islam and she thought that what the Prophet is saying is that remain a slave. But that's not what he was saying. He was essentially saying that become a wife. And so the Prophet when, she, when he saw this sincerity in her and he knew she was sincere, he immediately freed her and the freedom was her mahar and the proposition and this is something that then became uh, well known in Islamic fiqh that the milk yameen can be freed and the freeing of the milk yameen can be the mahar for her marriage right so this is something now well known in Islamic fiqh the first person was Safiya radiallahu anha that she was a milk yameen and her freedom became her mahar and that's when the, the zawaj takes place because when you're milk yameen, then there is no uh, wali or two witnesses. Or the two witnesses are the people there, meaning even that you need two witnesses. But the two witnesses in that case were the people around the Prophet ﷺ. And there is no wali when it comes to milk yameen. The milk yameen does not have the wali whatnot. So uh, the, the zawaj takes place in Muharram of the seventh year. And the mahar was the freedom that was given to uh, Safiya. And they finished up at Khaybar, uh, whatever they needed to be doing, uh, the, the army and whatnot. And of course, uh, the consummation cannot take place uh, after the milk yameen has been taken until one cycle takes place, one haydah takes place, just so that there is no confusion of paternity. And it just so happened that uh, her cycle finished on the way back to Medina. Okay, so she must have told the women of this. And so when this occurred, so the Prophet ﷺ asked to spend the night with her, but she refused that night. She said, not this night. And this happened at a place called Tubar, which was six mil or six miles from Khaybar. Then on the next night, they reached a place called As-Suhba, which was uh, an, an entire day's journey away. And that was when Safiya agreed. And some of the Ansar ladies prepared her for the wedding night and perfumed her and gave her special clothing. We have Umm Sinan al Ansariya, one of the people who prepared her. She narrates the, in the first person some details. And this is recorded in the Tabaqat of Ibn Sa'd. It's very interesting that she says that she feels flustered, that we didn't have any of the special decorations, we didn't have the preparatory tent. So, obviously, in every culture, when you get married, in every culture, you have certain things that you do. But nobody was expecting a marriage. And so Umm Sinan, she's now been entrusted with Safiya, and she's obviously lamenting, we didn't have anything. We didn't have all the decorations. We didn't have anything that was supposed to have. So what I did was I took some sheets and we made a special room out of them, you know, in between the branches. And we perfumed her with whatever we had. We combed her and we gave her whatever the clothing that they had amongst all of the ladies. They found whatever they could. And Umm Sinan narrates that uh, Safiya was a young and beautiful lady and she would take the beautification with the ease of the best of ladies. Meaning that, you know, some uh, ladies when you put on beautification, it makes them look even naturally much better. And that's what Safiya was, that radiallahu anha, she was, uh, she was blessed with a natural beauty that complemented whatever was given on top of that. And Umm Sinan says that I never smelled any fragrance better than the fragrance of that night. Meaning, whatever we could do, 
Allah blessed it to make even more fragrant than it was, right? Whatever fragrances we had, Allah blessed it and I smelled something that I never smelt before. Before we knew it, the Prophet ﷺ had arrived. We had already instructed Safiya that when he entered the room to stand up to greet him, which she did, and we then left them together. The next morning, Umm Sinan says, we took Safiya to help her do her ghusl and we asked her, how did she find the Prophet ﷺ? And she replied, the Prophet ﷺ was very happy with me and we spent the night awake and he kept on talking to me and she herself narrates in other hadith some snippets of that narration of that conversation she says for example one of the questions that the process asked me was that why I said no the previous night why did I delay to this night and she said I replied we were still close to Khaybar and I was worried that the Yahud might launch a counter attack we were just outside of Khaybar, and I was worried that, you know, you had agreed to a settlement. What if they betrayed the settlement? What if they attack back? I wanted to put some distance between the army and us, between the Khaybar and us, and so I delayed to the second day. And so when the Prophet heard this, he was greatly impressed at her intelligence and foresight, and the fact that her concern is now for whom? For the Muslim army. Her concern immediately changes for the Muslim side. And this shows against the, the, the strength of her faith. And of the conversations that they had, that she says, the Prophet asked me about the bruises around my eye. I had a black eye. The bruises, what was that? And so I explained to him what had happened, meaning the dream and the husband, what not. And so, of course, this is now coming uh, true. And she herself says that, I still had something in my heart. Yes, good Muslim, what not. Something in my heart regarding my father. After all, the father is the father. And the father was executed by the command, obviously, of the Prophet ﷺ. So, I still had something in my heart. And the Prophet ﷺ kept on explaining to me. إِلَيَّ and making excuses to me for what he had to do. And... He told me that my father did this and that and he explained because now here's the point obviously and this is well known in human history even the most brutal of dictators are good to their families. Okay? Even bad people they actually have a good side in their private lives. Right? And this is well known. I can mention to you a gazillion episodes. I mean, Genghis Khan read his biography. He was actually a very loving husband and father. Right? And outside of the household, he is, his name is infamous, right? Hitler. I mean, all of these people, amongst their entourage, their clothes, there's always that side that happens, right? So understandably, Safiya is seeing which side of her father? She's seeing the daughter's side, understandably, right? So she's feeling something. And the Prophet is explaining on the outside what is happening that you don't know. Right? So he continued to make excuses and and he give justification until everything that was in my heart disappeared. Right? So subhanAllah, we really see here the gentleness. The Prophet understands that. How will Safiya be feeling? And so he is the one initiating, knowing what is going to be happening until finally, you know, uh, all of those feelings go away in her heart. Now, one of the uh, somewhat funny uh, uh, incidents, I mentioned this again when we did the Battle of Khaybar, that takes place here. The Prophet ﷺ understood Safiya to be sincere. He knew her to be sincere. He is, of course, Rasulullah. Not everybody was so good natured. And a number of Sahaba felt that this was an act. I mean, how could this lady go from being a Yahudiya to so enthusiastic in one day? Right? And of the people who really felt something is wrong, is Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. And so Abu Ayyub volunteered to take his sword and stand at a distance from the tent that night. And he continued to pace the tent, not going to sleep the whole night. And when the Prophet came out the next morning, he saw Abu Ayyub with the sword standing in the distance. And Abu Ayyub said, Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah. And the Prophet said, what? What, ha what? And Abu Ayyub said, Ya Rasulullah, this young lady, her father and her brother and her tribe, and I didn't feel safe with her and you. I just stood at a distance. If anything happened, you could have called and I would have listened. Subhanallah. Yani this is now 
volunteering you know so the prophet laughed at this and yani uh, uh, made dua for ayub ayub for his uh, enthusiasm but he knew he's the prophet so he knew this is not something that is uh, needed and the same day the walima took place and this shows us uh, that the walima can take place before or after the consummation. Because for Zainab, we said uh, a few weeks ago, it took place before the consummation. And now for uh, uh, Safiya, it is taking place after the consummation. So on the same day, the walima took place. And the Prophet ﷺ, now they don't have any extra animals. They don't have any you know, luxury to have anything. You know, the, 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 like for Zayma, Zainab, there was uh, meat and bread, which is the most luxurious uh, walima. For uh, Safiya, they don't have anything because they are traveling and they're going to next day arrive in Medina or a few days they're going to arrive in Medina. And so the Prophet ﷺ commanded that a sheet be placed and he said, whatever you have, just bring it. So some person bought two, three dates, some person bought dried biscuits, some person bought hails, it's called this and that. Hails is basically flour with ghee and butter and whatnot, just whatever they had. And small amount was there and the People ate whatever was there and it was baraka for them, but there was no meat and there was no bread. It was just whatever was the remnants of the food after that. And that was the walima of the Prophet Sallallahu and uh, Safiya. And the people were questioning on that night that is Safiya a milk yameen or is she a mother of the believers? Which one? Is she milk yameen or is she uh, a wife of the Prophet Sallallahu So they said that if she comes out covered, then she is a wife. Yani the extra hijab as you know. And if she comes out not, then she is milk yameen. And the next morning, she came out fully covered. And the Prophet called for his camel. There's no, spe there's no extra camel because again, nobody's expecting a marriage to take place. There's no spare camel to give. So she's going to ride and share the camel of the Prophet So he asked that his camel um, be brought out. And then... One of the most uh, you know, amazing things that is usually mentioned when we talk about the, uh, the, um, the, the, the way the Prophet treated his wives, the romance in the Sunnah. These are some of the instances that are mentioned there. That he asked the camel to be lowered. And obviously, Safiya is fully covered and she's not used to being in, you know, abaya, whatever it is. And she's awkward and whatnot. And the camel is obviously, even a seated camel, by the way, is like this high, as you all know from your back home, 10 rupees rise that you do. It's all the way up there, right? So, uh, uh, on the coast of Gulshan Iqbal or wherever you go. Oh, no, no, it's not Gulshan Sorry, what is it? The coast of the uh, Clifton. Sorry, Clifton, right? So, uh, uh, the, the camel is still relatively high. So, how is Safiya going to get up? This is one of those interesting anecdotes, right? What did the Prophet do? He lowered himself down. He lowered himself down. And he got on his knees and he put one knee outward. So one knee and one foot out and one knee down. Right? So the right knee is out and the left knee is down. To offer his own thigh as a stepping stool for Safiya. Right? And Safiya became embarrassed. Obviously, it's the Prophet ﷺ and giving the thigh to him to her, she became embarrassed and she didn't do anything. So the Prophet ﷺ held on to one of her feet and bent the knee so that her knee would be on his thigh. Like nudging her, come on forward. And so then Safiya came on top of the camel and then the Prophet ﷺ rode the uh, camel and uh, that was their return to Medina. And uh, an incident is narrated that, again, subhanAllah, all of this and one of the reasons that it's so beautiful to read the seerah is you really get a glimpse of the human lives. And you really see the people as they were, not between the two extremes of the exaggerated unreality or also the dismissal by the modernists and progressives. You find the real middle balance. And there's an incident that... Again, there's not much benefit per se, but it's just a human episode that really demonstrates the humanity of everybody, including our Prophet and Safiya, and including the Sahaba. It is mentioned that, and again, we have still maybe two, three days march back, right? And the camels are already tired, and the camel is not expecting or not accustomed to two people now. It's not supposed to be done because it wasn't meant for be the multiple rides. So what happens? On the way back, 
Allah knows exactly when the books don't mention when, but outside of Medina, the camel falters and trips. This is the camel of the Prophet and Safiya. And so when it falters and trips, obviously, Safiya and the Prophet fall forward. Now, who is going to help the mother of the... Nobody. Nobody is allowed to do anything. And so the Sahaba, the books mentioned, they simply turn away and give privacy. Nobody even looked. Because had it been only the Prophet they would have jumped. But now it is the Prophet and his wife. So they didn't even look. And every one of them averted their gaze away and allowed the Prophet to dust Safiya, put her back on the camel and get back on the journey. Right? Small incident. And for me, it just shows a volume of humanity. It just like your mind boggles at this minor incident that shows us, and if Allah had wanted, this wouldn't have happened. Right? I mean, if Allah had wanted, the camel would have had wings and they fly to Medina. Correct? But Allah is also wanting to show us that yes, He is human and His camel is a regular camel. Right? And Safiya is a... Everything is being demonstrated in a way that me personally, the love and admiration goes up even more. Right? Now I know some understandings of Islam, they, they won't even believe this is there, but this is in the books. And it is mentioned in Tabaqat, which is one of the earliest books of Sirah. And it actually, for me, it demonstrates again the humanity of everyone involved, the respect that the Sahaba had, in spite of them seeing him to be fully human. But still that love and respect and admiration that they had. And as well, I mean, all of these details, by the way, again, I mean, have to be mentioned this year, all of these explicit details of the wedding night and whatnot. By the way, why is it not mentioned for other wives? Most likely because... In this case, the wedding and the wedding night takes place on the road between Khaybar and Medina, right? And so it's a very public thing happening. And so we have a little bit more details than uh, usual. On their return to Medina, uh, Safiya doesn't have a house. And the houses in front of the masjid are all booked now, right? So they have to construct a house for her a few blocks away. Unlike Aisha, Hafsa, or Misal, they are in the row. But Safiya's house is not in that row along with some of the other wives. We're going to talk about that, inshallah. Uh, we'll talk about that later on, inshallah. But Safiya's house has to be constructed. So where is she going to live? So she goes to the house of one of the Ansar. His name is Al-Hadith ibn Nu'man. Al-Hadith ibn Nu'man. We can assume that he must have had a larger house than usual in a spare room. Otherwise, why choose this house? So she stays there for a few days when the house is being constructed. And in these few days, who is going to come visit Safiya? Tell me. The other wives. They are the most eager to come and see Safiya. And Aisha says, I could barely contain my frustration and excitement when I wrapped the niqab, tanaqabtu, I wrapped myself up and I rushed in to go and see, you know, uh, Safiya binti Huyay. And the Prophet Arafani, he recognized me despite my disguise. Okay? Now, some of the brothers here probably will never understand this, but I can assure you, having lived in a land of niqabs, you can recognize your niqabi wife in a sea of niqabs. No problem. This is something even I wouldn't have understood unless I lived there. But you can recognize through a million and one things. From the eyes, from everything, you can recognize your wife. Otherwise, if you have never lived in a niqab land, you go and you see three niqabs, you wouldn't even know your wife, right? But once you live there for years and years, so... Aisha thought the Prophet would not recognize her. And the Prophet recognized her coming into the room, seeing Safiya going back. So he then, when he met up with her, he said, what did you think of her? What did you think of your visit? She didn't know that he recognized her. What did you think of your visit? And so, obviously, she wants to trivialize, right? So she snorted. She goes, I just saw a Yahudiya. Like, you just saw an average, just one of them, because they must have looked different, Right? And it's an ethnically different group, as we said, right? So she's not from the Arab tribe. We can explain this. So it must have had a different look. So she's trying to make any trivial of it. And the Prophet ﷺ defended Safiya and, and said, لا تقولي, Don't say that, O Aisha, for she has accepted Islam and she has hasunat Islam, which she has now has strong Islam. 
She has accepted Islam and she's a good Muslimah. Don't mention her past yani, Yahudiyah. And subhanAllah, from my reading, as much as I could find, this is the only time Aisha used this slip. The other wives continue to use it later on. But from my reading, this was the one and only time, the first day that she saw, she said, and after that she never once mentioned this phrase again. Because as we will mention, that she did have to battle. And one of the things I want you to think about that most people don't really think about, the difficulties of being a convert in a strange society. The difficulties of being the only one of your race, of your culture, to accept Islam. And you don't have any support system. You don't have family. You don't have your culture even, right? Because Safiya, okay, she spoke Arabic. But frankly, her Arabic would have even been slightly different than the Arabic of the Arabs. Because she has, it's called Judaicized Arabic. It's a slightly different Arab Arabic. Ethnically, she's different. Her culture is different. She has no family in Medina. And the strangeness she would have felt, and on top of that, her strangeness is being re reminded, rubbed into her by those who are jealous of her, multiple times. The iman that she must have had to overcome that. And the purity of her soul is something that is truly admirable. And we also especially need to think of this in our times as well, with our converts of this land, when they convert, that subhanAllah, the battles that they are facing in every single aspect. And we have to give them whatever help that we can. And Safiya felt every time her Yahudiya past was brought up. She really felt it. She felt multiple times. And I mentioned already some episodes when I talked with the other wives, yani, a number of other of our mothers, and may Allah forgive them, and Allah has forgiven them. Yani, um Salama and Hafsa and Zainab, we already mentioned Aisha, they're all once in a while bringing it up, right? It is mentioned that the Prophet once he visited Safiya and she was crying, sobbing. What happened? Hafsa put me down and said, You are nothing but a Yahudiya. You are nothing but a Yahudiya. What? And anyway, we don't have to worry about you. And she's already alone in the city. <coughs> and now it's really hurting her that she's not getting that support. And so she's now crying on her own house. And so the Prophet himself cheers her up and says, What do they have against you? What privilege do they have against you? For you are the daughter of a Prophet. And your uncle is a prophet. And you are married to a prophet. Meaning Musa and Harun and myself. Okay? Because Harun is one of her, is her ancestors. She's from the tribe of Uzzad, the, 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 the tribe of the Bani Israel that is from Harun. And her uncle is a prophet, meaning Musa. And you are married to a prophet. Who can claim that amongst them? And so he himself cheers up Safiya and, you know, uh, calms her down. And he then goes to Hafsa and uh, rebukes her that do not say this uh, Hafsa anymore. And uh, Umm Salama as well, and I already mentioned the issue of Zainab, and uh, we'll mention it again because we're going to mention the incident of the Hajj. All of this, it really did hurt her, but she continued to struggle to the end and overcome it, and her reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the interesting tidbits that we also learn is that out of all of the wives, it appears that she was the one that uh, cooked the best and the most exotic foods. And that is fully understandable because it's not her culture. She's coming from a different culture. So her culture is a slightly different one. And of the things that, that we can derive this from, Aisha herself says that I never saw anyone cook as much as Safiya. And one day she sent a dish to my house when the Prophet was there with his guests. And I became so angry that I took the dish and smashed it down. Meaning I'm insulted. This is my house. Don't try to show your favors and that's what she's feeling now, right? That it's my day today. Even though it's halal, nothing wrong. She's not coming herself. She's sending a gift like she cooked fresh food. Fresh food doesn't last four or five days. There's no fridge. Fresh food is there. Go send it to the Prophet ﷺ. She knows there's some guests sitting there. So, I mean, you know, she's pure intention. But Aisha, she gets so frustrated. She lifts the dish and she smashes it down. And the Sahaba are all quiet now. And imagine, subhanAllah, and this is a very, again, yani, one of us, what would we have done? What would we have done? You have embarrassed me. Huh? What is the phrase? Nak Katalia, right? Huh? Isn't that it, right? You've made me feel whatever. But our Prophet 
picked up the dish himself and cleansed the food and put it on another plate and said to Aisha, bring another plate to give back. The plate that you broke, you're going to bring another plate back. And then said to the Sahaba, your mother has become jealous. Don't ignore it. Gharat <laughs> ummukum. Don't worry. He didn't rebuke her. He didn't feel embarrassed himself. And he didn't get involved. As we said many times, these issues, he kept himself aloof from them. And he goes, this is something that he didn't get involved with. But he did insist on another dish of equal size and whatnot being sent back because that was the fault of Aisha. So this also shows us fiqhi thing here. If somebody lends you something and then you break it, huh? what's the saying? You break it, you, what is it? No, is it? Is it? No, no, it was something else, huh? Uh, something like this. Yeah, okay, so if you break it, then you're going to have to you know, pay for it. So whatever it is that this is a fiqhi ruling, by the way. It's a fiqhi ruling, and this is one of the incidents we derive it from. That if uh, you take something from somebody, and your fault, something happens to it. Well then, it's your responsibility. Because it's something that you have uh, taken uh, upon yourself to do. In any case, the point is that uh, this shows us that Safiya is a cook. And she's cooking and she's gifting to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of the incidents that are narrated about uh, Safiya as well, is that once she was traveling with uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, she was on one of the camels and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had his servant Anjasha with him. And this is the famous uh, phrase that the Prophet said that Anjasha was in a hurry and he was telling the camels to be hasty. And so the camels were moving quickly to go. And the Prophet felt that Safiya might be uh, yani irritated by the, the quick movement of the camel. And so he said to Anjasha, that famous phrase that has become an expression in Arabic now, Ya Anjasha, rifqan bil qawarir. That, O oh Anjasha, be gentle with thee fragile vessels with the crystals that are on your, uh, you know, your payload here. Be careful with that. So the point is that the Prophet ﷺ felt that Safiya might be finding it awkward, the camel moving so fast. And he's also reminding Anjasha that you should treat the women with the dignity and the gentleness that they, uh, that they deserve. I already mentioned the story of Safiya and the Hajj camel as well. For some reason, a lot of her stories involve camels. I don't know why, but a lot of them involve camels. And it's just... Maybe just complete, obviously, Qadr of Allah coincidence here. But we already mentioned the story in some detail. And because it involves Safiya, I'll quickly repeat it that uh, on the way to Hajj, they only did one Hajj in the lifetime of the Prophet, as we all know, the one Hajj that they did. On the way to Hajj, all of the wives have one camel, obviously. And Safiya's camel, when they stop for a stopping, Safiya's camel just breaks free and runs away. Right? I already mentioned this incident last time. So Safiya loses her camel. And she begins to cry and essentially sob hysterically. And all the Sahaba can hear because now, I mean, obviously, it's anything, any one of us. It's a very, and this is on the way to. So imagine all the everything has to happen, right? So it's just a big disaster. And she's crying and crying and crying. So the Prophet system gets off his camel and he consoles her. And with his own blessed hands, he wipes the tears from her cheeks. Right? So clearly there is definitely very much compassion and love between them. He consoles her, he consoles her, she does not become consoled. And so he becomes somewhat forceful and says, okay, enough now. We will deal with this, enough now. And this phrase frightened Safiya. She stopped crying, right? She stopped crying. And the Prophet said, we will camp here tonight. They weren't expected to camp. They had to move on. But because of Safiya, the whole... There wasn't an army, it's hujjaj. The whole uh, uh, caravan is going to spend the night there. And now she was so worried. Did I insult, the, not insult, did I make the process of irritated, what not? And it was supposed to be her night anyway. So she goes to Aisha and she says, Oh Aisha, you know that I would never give you my night. But tonight I will give you my night with one condition. You make sure that... The Prophet knows that I gifted and he doesn't have anything as hard against me. If he does, then you make sure that he will forgive me. She was so worried, even though there was nothing. But she became so worried that maybe, you know, because of me, the whole army has stopped, the whole caravan has stopped because of me. And so Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, obviously she was going to take that gift. Uh, the, the narration goes that when she came, uh, the Prophet said, Aisha, how can you be here? It's not your day, your night. And she says, ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءَ 
Okay? This is Allah's blessings He gives to whomever He pleases. And she explains what um, happens. Uh, and of course, um, at this time as well, you know, the, the incident with Zainab also takes place when the, the, the camel sharing. You know that that incident we mentioned it as well. And again, you can now, you know, till the end of her life, she has to always deal with this. And subhanAllah, we really have to, as I said, yeah, and he cut uh, our converse a lot of slack that they have a lot of issues that they have to face that um, indeed we have our own issues battling Islamophobia from without but they have multiple issues Islamophobia from without and internal racism from within and other you know, things from within we have to always be extra uh, you know, cognizant of that um, and after the Hajj was over and they were about to come back the Prophet was informed that Safiya's period had begun and she hadn't done tawaf al wada. Okay? So, uh, the Aisha radiallahu anha, she had missed the tawaf, the, 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 the tawaf and sa'i of the qudum because of her menses. Right? And Safiya is missing tawaf al wada. And this is of the wisdoms of our mothers being so many in number. We can get different fiqh rulings from different things. And this is one of the most important fiqh rulings we get from Hajj and we get it because of Safiya and that she was in her monthly cycle in that time. So uh, when so the, the, the camp is being packed, everybody's eager to go back to Medina and the news reaches the Prophet وسلم, that Safiya hers has just started and she hasn't done the right that everybody else did that day, which is Tawaf al Wada. So he uttered a phrase which is not translated in Arabic. These are simply phrases of irritation, aqra, habsa. Um, uh, which basically, aqra halqa, excuse me, aqra halqa, which basically is phrases that the best way to translate is, a, is, is just ex, uh, frustration is the best way. You don't translate it literally. Frustration, like, oh my God, is this happening really? So there's frustration. Everybody's frustrated. And he said, is she going to hold us back from going back to Medina? And he, because <laughs> she's not any regular lady. She is the wife of the Prophet and if she remains, he remains. And if he remains, everybody remains, right? So he said, will she hold all of us back? Then he asked her, he called her, he said, did you perform the tawaf on the day of sacrifice? Which we call it in our fiqh, we'll call it, what type of tawaf is that one? You guys have forgotten hajj completely. Huh? You guys have... The Wafal Ifada, mashallah, very good, okay. So the one who's done five hajjahs, how many have you done? <laughs> inshallah, you'll do five hajjahs, inshallah. The main tawaf of hajj is tawaf al ifada. That's what we call tawaf al ifada. And that is done after the sacrifice or the day of sacrifice, basically, right? So he asked her, Did you do tawaf the day of sacrifice? She said, Yes. He said, In that case, pack your bags, we are leaving. And from this, we get the very important fiqhi principle that our sisters need to know when they go for hajj, that the tawaf of the wada, the goodbye tawaf, it is not obligatory upon the one in her menses. She can drop it without even a penalty. And if a man drops it, then he has to give a penalty, right? Uh, a woman in her menses, if, if she has done the ifala, then there's no penalty whatsoever. And she can return without even giving a dam. It is forgiven. And we know this from the incident of Safiya. That Safiya did the ifala. This also shows us, not going to the fiqh of hajj here, but if she hadn't done the ifala, then what? They would have stayed. Okay, so the ifada is the rukun. We have done this. But anyway, that's not, let's not get into the fiqh of hajj. And I have three lectures about the fiqh of hajj. You can go over them. So, point is that uh, Safiya's case shows us this as well. Also, one of the famous incidents regarding uh, Safiya radiallahu anha, which is mentioned uh, in Sahih al-Bukhari as well, that uh, during i'tikaf, Safiya radiallahu anha visited the Prophet in the masjid. And this shows us many things. First and foremost, no doubt the love. Secondly, a loneliness. She doesn't have relatives and friends in Medina. And the Prophet is her only source of companionship. And so, in the days of I'tikaf, when he's not visiting in the daytime, because he's not visiting in the daytime, she wants to go and talk with him. Thirdly, it also shows us it is allowed for conversations to take place in I'tikaf. Some people go to 
ultra extremes in itikaf and they think that they cannot have a regular conversation. What is not allowed is romantic and that stuff. Yes, but a regular conversation, even with one's spouse, it is allowed. And so Safiya is going to the masjid and she visited the Prophet after Isha and they stayed talking for a long time until it was late at night and the Prophet did not want Safiya to walk alone at night. Now, I want you to understand this is Medina in the time of the Prophet and still he was this protective, right? There's nothing wrong with being protective of your wife and your daughters. It is a part of one's fitra to do so. It is something that is natural and it is something that is there. In the city of the Prophet ﷺ, it is his own wife and he doesn't want her to walk alone. What does that show? Right? So he leaves the masjid to walk her because he's in itikaf. He's not going to enter the house. Right? He walks her to the door and he's going to come back. Right? So, and, and remember, her, her house was not attached to the masjid. Remember that, right? I mentioned this, right? So her house was not in the immediate. Had it been immediate, then it wouldn't have been a problem. Aisha's house, Hafsa's house, Umm Salam's house, you just walk right from the masjid to the house. But Safiya's house, you have to walk two, three blocks. It's on, um, if you're facing the Qibla, the house would be on the left-hand side outside the masjid, of the, the modern masjid, outside, literally outside the left-hand the masjid. Basically, on the Baqir side, right? Between the Baqir and the, the, the masjid, the process, and that's where her house would be. So he leaves the masjid and he's walking to the house of Safiya, pitch dark, it's the dark night. And two Ansar young men are walking and they're talking amongst themselves and then they recognize the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and with him is of course a lady in, in complete yani burqa and whatnot. and so the both of them lower their gaze completely shut up and rush forward out of haya out of haya and the Prophet says Ala rislikuma. slow down for she is my wife Safiya binti Huyay the two young lads are so embarrassed, flustered and blushing, they could only say, Ya Rasulullah, like, did you expect us to think anything else? Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, indeed, shaitan runs in a person like his own blood does. And I wanted to eliminate any doubt in your minds. SubhanAllah, where does one begin with this narration? It's so deep and profound, right? Yani the haya is obviously beautiful, the haya of the young men, right? That, they see the process and with his wife is like, okay, lower their head and just rush through as you expect them to do. It's exactly what you expect them to do. And the Prophet tells them, she is my wife, Safiya. I want you to know, this isn't a'udh bil a'udh. We don't even, and the young men don't even know what to say. They can't even verbalize. They can't even say it. They said, Ya Rasulullah, dot, dot, dot. Look at how much this, you know, sensitive situation is like, Ya Rasulullah. Yani, did you expect us to think anything else? And the Prophet is saying, it's not your fault. But he's setting the precedent, right? He's demonstrating that we have to have the upper hand here and to realize that, you know, rumors spread, people talk, you know, gubshab happens. This is the reality of human nature, right? Gossip, gossip, gossip. People love to gossip. They make something that is nothing and they make a whole. And we've seen this in the slander of Aisha, right? The most innocent incident ever. And what happened, happened. Right? So where there's a disease in the heart, what's going to happen? You're going to have the things, you know, happening. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says uh, that, I just wanted to remove this from your heart. And it also shows us as well that the, uh, the, the concept of shaitan running through the blood of the son of Adam, what this means is that shaitan is always eager at any opportunity. And also, we'll take it as it is literally and say that, Somehow, shaitan is able to basically enter our bodies and put these uh, thoughts into our uh, minds. And this also shows us that we should be cognizant of what misinformation people might have of us. And always be on the upper hand, if you like, and be generous. Don't think evil of people, but also be precautious about what people might think of you. Right? The Prophet did not accuse the two men of anything. But he made sure they couldn't have any negative thoughts. And of the incidents mentioned about Safiya as well, 
is that uh, her love for the Prophet was well known and uh, in the famous incident in the last days of his life when all of uh, the wives came at one occasion three days, four days before he passed away and he was coming in and out of consciousness and they could see the pain, they could see the sweat, they could see the fever and uh, Safiya was there with the other wives and she began to cry and she said, Ya Rasulullah, how I wish that your pain would leave you and come to me. How I wish I could have everything that you have and you have nothing, right? It just came out from her fitrah. It came out purely and sincerely. But the wives are wives in the end of the day, even if they are our mothers and even if they are the best of believers. And this shows us over and over again, there are no angels amongst the Bani Adam. There are no angels. These are our mothers. They are the best of the creation. Yet, they have mentioned her ethnicity multiple times. And this is, subhanAllah, sometimes you have very good people. They get angry and a slur comes out. Sometimes you have very good people and in their emotional state, when they get angry at you, they'll say something about you that is just downright rude and crude and obnoxious and bad. And there's still good people in other aspects and they make a mistake in this aspect. Correct? Do we not have the incident of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari and Bilal? Right? And Abu Dhar is Abu Dhar and Bilal is Bilal. Yet when Abu Dhar gets angry, what comes out comes out. And you remember what, the, I don't need to mention it here. You remember that incident, right? So it happens sometimes. And this is not a defense, but it is the reality. And therefore as well, we also, by the way, unfortunately we have a culture now of going to two extremes here. The one is to justify and the other is to take that slip up and khalas, the entire career and the entire legacy is completely gone because of one statement of anger. These are both extremes. A one-off mistake is not the same as a consistent habit, right? And we have here, once in a while, minor things happened and Allah has forgiven them. So, at the end of the Prophet's life, and Safiya says this, and some of the other of our mothers, they don't like this. And they pinpoint, they show signs, sarcasm, innuendo, as the case. Like, yeah, she thinks she's like, you know, what not. And the process is in and out of consciousness. When he comes back to consciousness, because he, there's a famous hadith, my eyes might sleep, but my heart never sleeps. Right, there are certain specialities of the process and even if he's in con unconscious still there is a consciousness that is separate than the bodily consciousness right so when he comes back to consciousness he points to those of the women who might have said something or made a sarcastic gesture or the you know the eyebrow raise the humazat al type of stuff that we know from the Quran and he points to them he goes go and do the wudu in one version go and wash your mouths out they said why ya rasulullah he said, because you have done يعني, Lumaza or Ghumaza, you have done the, the sarcasm towards her. And Wallahi innaha la sadiqa. She is truthful in what she has said. She would willingly take all of my pain and take it on her if it would go away from me. She is truthful in what she said. And this is an amazing testimony to Safiya. And it is one of the last uh, praises that the Prophet gave to any of his wives. And it was to Safiya. And this shall forever be one of her legacies that the Prophet praised her amongst the very last praises, if not the last praise that he ever did to any wife. It was to Safiya radiallahu anha. After the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she lived uh, like the other wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she did go on hajj. As we said, the majority of wives went on hajj when Umar offered them to go for hajj. Uh, and... Uh, her house, as I said, was not in the immediate vicinity. It just so happened that it was the house that was um, next to the house of Uthman ibn Affan. Okay, so it was a very strategic location. Now, one uh, incident happened in the time of Umar, radiallahu an, that shows us, um, again, her good nature uh, and her forgiving uh, nature that she had uh, a jadi, a slave girl, who, whatever reason, had a grudge against her. And so this uh, uh, slave invented a lie against her. And she complained to Umar radiallahu an that Safiya still observes the Sabbath, the Sabbath. And she still has ties with the Yahud. And subhanAllah, how painful is this that after all these years and still that slur is coming up, right? How painful is that, right? 
And so Umar sends a messenger to her. Or maybe he goes himself. We don't really know for sure. And because he's allowed to go behind the curtain. And asks, what is this I'm hearing? And she says, as for the Sabbath, I have never had any need of it since Allah has substituted Friday for me. This is a complete lie. And as for the connection with the Yahud, I still have family that are Yahud. And yes, they come visit. And yes, they do. What's wrong with that? So Umar confirms her iman and whatnot and lets uh, and uh, uh, lets her be and she calls the the slave and asks why did you do this and she gives excuses and she blames shaitan and whatnot and instead of rebuking instead of getting angry instead of punishing which she has every right to do she frees her for the sake of allah to expect a reward on judgment day so her slave did dhulm and in response she gets freed this is again coming from the nature of Safiya radiallahu anha. And one of the last things that is narrated about, which is actually very, very interesting, and that is the uh, incidents that took place in the last days of the life of Uthman radiallahu anha. Because of the location of Safiya's house, she felt a more obligation, if you like, than the other wives. Because technically, the other wives understood they have to stay at home, really. They couldn't really do anything. But her house and Uthman's house were next to one another. Next to, literally, next to one another. And when the people surrounded the house of Uthman, she can hear and see everything taking place. And it gets from bad to worse, as we all know. And a point in time came where they cut off the food supplies. Remember the story of Uthman? And so she decided from her own ijtihad that her presence might help diffuse the situation. Unbelievably, she then donned the burqa, the, the abaya, and she asked for a mule to come. And she then, even though it was across the road, but she should not be walking. That's the extra hijab and whatnot. And so she got on this animal to go and enter the house of Uthman to send the message that I am here now, what are you going to do? And not, without any weapons, her presence is the weapon. Like Her presence was meant to intimidate them. Right? So she felt that if I go, maybe that's going to diffuse the situation, subhanAllah. So it was really a tragic, and she felt the moral obligation. But the people, the mob are the mob. And again, it's one of those sad realities that shows us yani, human history and our history and Islamic history. It has its ups, but it also has its downs. And one of them, the famous, yani, one al Ashtar was his name, is a well known person, well known personality. Uh, he didn't uh, touch our mother, he could never, nobody would ever do that. But he smacked the animal. He smacked the animal. And Safiya understood that these people don't have any minds, they don't have any iman or taqwa. If they can dare to indirectly insult, and he didn't dare do anything to Safiya, but to the animal, it's an indication that don't go beyond here, right? So Safiya understood that this is not wise. And so she then went back into her house and did not proceed further. However, what she did command to do was to put a plank between her house and Uthman's house and order that food be delivered from her house to the house of Uthman. And so there would be a food supply chain from her house to Uthman's house so that he would be supplied with food. And again, subhanAllah, this shows us that in her loving heart, she just wants to help the situation, do whatever she can. And she tried her best to do whatever she could. But obviously, Uthman's death had been written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, Safiya lived uh, until the month of Ramadan in around 50 or 52 Hijrah, one of these two days, most likely 50 Hijrah. Uh, and she died in the reign of Muawiyah radiallahu an, around 60 years old, uh, plus 60 plus years old. Again, we don't have an exact date because because of her background. We don't know exactly when she was born, but rough ideas we have. And uh, she did not narrate that many hadith we have some hadith we will do um, today probably around 10 hadith that she has and one of the interesting things about her is that out of all of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu perhaps she was the wealthiest one uh, amongst them uh, she passed away with around a hundred thousand uh, dirhams and perhaps it is something that they are aware of yani she was raised in a way that she knows how to uh, engage in business or whatever so she passes away with relative wealth and in her will she had written that her nephew should be given one third, which is the wasiya. And her nephew was her sister's son. And her sister's son was still upon the faith of his people. So the people raised a hue and the cry, a hue and a cry. 
that how can we give the wealth of our mother to a Yehudi? A Yehudi. And the matter was raised to Aisha radiallahu anha. She's still alive at the time. And Aisha said, Ittaqillah, fear Allah. This is her money. And Allah has given her the right of one third. And this is her wasiyah to her own nephew. And so give it to the nephew. And so the nephew was given 33,000 uh, dirhams, which is a mini fortune. And it comes from the household of the Prophet sallallahu And this shows us Subhanallah, yani this is, just imagine here, her kith and kin are still Yehudi. Think about that. And she is our mother. And this shows us that there doesn't have to be animosity per se. The awkwardness, even in the time of the Sahaba, how can we give it to them, right? But it's her relatives. It's her own nephew. And she, it's her money that she's gotten. as halal money and it's something that she's given to her nephew. And in the end, it does go to uh, that person. And that is the max that we have about Safiya radiallahu ta'ala anha. And as usual, we will finish off with some ahadith from, of Safiya radiallahu an. Uh, we only have a few uh, ahadith and uh, in the Muslim Imam Ahmad, uh, we have just, I'll mention three of them uh, that uh, Safiya mentions. And this, this hadith that uh, we're going to mention, it is actually Mutafaq Ali Bukhari and Muslim. So this hadith is actually Safiya is narrating it and it is Bukhari and Muslim and also Muslim Imam Ahmad that Safiya says, I heard the Prophet Sallallahu say that people will continue to uh, attack the Kaaba until an army uh, will come to attack it and they will be in the plains of Bayda, uh, which is outside of Mecca and the earth will swallow them up all of them, the first of them and the last of them, and no one will be saved amongst them. So I said, Ya Rasulullah, how about the one who was forced to be in that army? So he replied, they will be resurrected based upon their niyyah. And Allah will judge them based upon their niyyah. So this uh, hadith shows us that the Kaaba, despite its sanctity, there will be, throughout history, attempts to attack it. And one of the more interesting hadith, not this one, it's another one. Our Prophet ﷺ said, None shall attack the Kaaba and break the haram of the Kaaba other than those who believe in the sanctity of the Kaaba. Meaning, no outsider will ever successfully attack the Kaaba as long as there are Muslims alive. But who will attack the Kaaba? Internal war. And this has happened multiple times in history. Multiple times. Most recently when the current state kicked out the great grandfather of the state in Jordan. How did they get the lands of Mecca? Army. Right? So it has always been throughout history. And even after that in 1979, but this wasn't a civil war, but still what happened there? You know, the, 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 the siege of Mecca, the Johaman siege of Mecca that I've given a whole many lectures about online. And I have one of my specialities is the Johaman. I've given academic papers. Believe it or not, I'm not trying to stuff a lot. Sounds very boastful, I should say this. At Harvard, I gave an academic paper about Johaman. Uh, one of my first papers about Johaman. Uh, and I've studied his books in a lot of detail. And I've given lectures about him. And I've interviewed followers of his and, and, and whatnot. So I have a personal interest in that. But that incident in 1979 is a very strange incident. And the hadith is there that there will always be people who are trying to attack the Kaaba. But they're never going to actually destroy the Kaaba until obviously who's going to destroy it is going to be after the end of Islam. Right when the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Mahdi and everybody has gone. But at one of these occasions, an army will attack and Allah will intervene and destroy them. And Allah will open up the ground and swallow up the entire army, the first of them and the last of them and the middle of them. However large the army is, they will be taken care of. When will this happen? This will happen when the Mahdi is in Mecca without any army. And that is the sign that he is the Mahdi. And when Juhayman did what he did, 
he banked on this hadith and his check was not deposited, it was rejected. He thought Allah would give him this. That's why he did what he did. His whole interpretation was messianic. He didn't have the army to oppose the family of Su'ud. He didn't have an army to fight all the people. He had his group of fanatics, you know, five, six hundred people, max. Five, six hundred men, women, and children, probably two hundred men. That's it, max. There was one American amongst them as well, by the way. One American was amongst them. And what was his goal? His goal was that when the family, royal family, sends its forces, Allah will take care of them. That was his goal. And it didn't happen. Why? Because we do not take the ahadith and write a Hollywood script and enact them. We don't do that. It will happen, it will happen. We don't enact a drama through the hadith, which is what he tried to do. We don't do that. But the, where did he get the hadith from? This is the hadith here. His entire philosophy was from the hadith of Safiyyah. That's what he thought would happen. It's It's Bukhari and Muslim hadith. Authentic hadith. The problem is not the hadith. The problem is his uh, fanaticism. Uh, of the hadith of Safiyyah radiallahu an, is that um, a lady enters upon Safiyyah and uh, asks about uh, the nabith of the uh, dates. And she says the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has forbidden a nabith And this hadith is a very controversial hadith. Uh, what is a nabith uh, This is a very controversial issue, brothers and sisters. And unfortunately, it has been misunderstood in our times. Uh, nabith is a drink that the Arabs would love um, and before Islam. And there's a controversy. Is it halal post-Islam or not? And it's basically you take some water and you put some dates in it for two, three days. And what's going to happen? Fermentation, right? Now, generally speaking, the level of fermentation is so, 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 so low. And especially if it's for a day or two, that it's not a big deal, okay? But if you keep it for longer than that, then the level gets somewhat problematic. And so the majority of scholars, three madhab said, Nabith, yeah, they said, <laughs> yani most of them said haram outright, and some said like very, very, very makru haram, like that type of stuff, okay? And one of the madhab, the madhab of the people of Kufa, they said that Nabith is allowed. And so this is that controversy from the, from the time of the past. Is it allowed or not? And uh, there's no question it's best to avoid it, but technically speaking if it does not intoxicate and that's something that we know now in modern science we don't need to get a guesswork in our times we don't need the guesswork any drink that intoxicates in a reasonably large quantity three four five six glasses is a reasonably large quantity if you drink six seven glasses and you get intoxicated then one sip of that drink is haram right and if you drink a reasonable quantity, an average person can drink a reasonable quantity because we don't judge the sharia on unreasonable. We don't judge it on three gallons. Nobody drinks three gallons you know, in, in a, a meal or something. But if a, a reasonable quantity will not uh, intoxicate an average person, then the drink is halal. Now, whether you want to call it makru or not for other reasons is besides the point. Technically, the drink is halal. And so we don't have to worry about the two, three days. That's the position, inshallah. Is correct. Anyway, so that's the, the hadith of Safiya. Um, here we also have the famous hadith of Safiya that I went to visit the Prophet وسلم, while he was in Itikaf and I went at night and I spoke to him for a long time. Then I stood up to leave. So he stood up with me. He, she didn't ask for that. He, she, uh, he stood up with me and walked with me. And my house was next to the house of Usama ibn Zaid. So another house of his neighbors was Usaba ibn Zayd, meaning it was from the Ansari's house. So two of the men of the Ansar came. When they saw the Prophet sallallahu they rushed forward. The Prophet sallallahu said, calm down or slow down. Verily, she is Safiya binti Huyay. They said, subhanallah, ya Rasulallah. And the Prophet sallallahu said, verily, shaitan runs through the son of Adam like his blood does. And I was worried that shaitan might put an evil thought into your hearts. So this is the famous hadith that I have already um, done. And uh, the final hadith, okay, that's already been done. 
the other hadith that I've already mentioned to it, uh, it's a longer hadith, I'm just going to summarize it, and that is the hadith of Safiya's interaction with Zainab uh, when Zainab uh, refused to share the camel with her. So Safiya also narrates that from her perspective, and that's also in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed. So this brings us to the conclusion of uh, Safiya radiallahu anha. And I was, uh, I knew there was so much information, so I was not able to time-wise finish up Maymuna radiallahu anha, which means we will have a halaqa on Maymuna after the month of Ramadan, insha'Allah. So this is not our final halaqa. I, I honestly thought it would be, but I will have to do one halaqa for Maymuna, and then we will have our farewell halaqa, insha'Allah ta'ala, after that one. So there will be a a farewell halaqa inshallah Wednesday halaqa in the last week of June inshallah and then I will be inshallah um, asking my permission to leave all of you in the end of June inshallah ta'ala uh, with that inshallah any questions about uh, Safiya radiallahu anha <laughs> any questions about Safiya radiallahu anha <laughs> Why her father chose the same reason why Iblis chose. Why did Iblis choose to not prostrate? Kibr. Arrogance. Allah mentions in the Quran the reason why they rejected him was because they did not want the Prophet to be from the other camp. This is explicit in the Quran. They wanted the Prophet to be from their camp, right? Uh, this was revealed in response to Huyay. A number of verses of Baqarah, they were revealed about Huyay, by the way. I didn't mention this because of time, but Allah revealed a number of verses about Huyay ibn Akhtab. That Huyay was the one who recognized the Prophet ﷺ, and he said, I'm going to be his enemy. There are many people, and I will tell you from my own personal experience, there are many people who know the truth of Islam, but they do not accept it. Many of the most obvious reasons is not even arrogance, is just comfort of familiarity. Like to have to break away from your culture is not easy. To have to leave your set of family and friends, it requires courage, conviction, dedication. It requires Safiya binti Huyayt. It requires somebody who's willing to give up everything. When she says, I'd rather be a Muslim, a slave, than return to my family, what does that mean? What level of Iman is that? Think about it, right? It's not easy. She literally says, I'd rather be a Muslim and a slave than return to kufr and my family. That's not easy. And that level requires a huge commitment and Allah chooses those whom He blesses you know, to be of that, of that stature. So we should never be surprised. This is the reality of, of humanity. Truth is difficult to follow. We can flip it around. I can ask myself, you can ask yourself, why do we commit sins? Why do we knowingly reject the truth when we know it is true? We can ask the exact same question. That same response that I have when I commit a sin, multiply that by a million or whatever, and that's why a non-Muslim who recognizes Islam might not accept Islam. It's just too difficult. So this is the reality of humanity. Wallahu musta'an. Inshallah.